I'm Jim Benson, and you're listening to TV Time Machine. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and visit our show archives at tvtimemachine.com. Today on the TV Time Machine, we ask you to play musical chairs as we make a 180-degree turn to experience a unique and remarkable voice. In this edition of our program, we are proud to welcome one of the semi-finalists from the second season of The Voice, Lindsay Paveo. A member of Team Christina, Ms. Paveo's journey on the NBC series is not only distinguished by her popularity that season, but her moving and uniquely ethereal voice that resulted in a record amount of iTunes downloads. Over the next segment, Lindsay Paveo will not only help us explore virtually every aspect of her amazing experience on The Voice, but will also talk about her upcoming album, The Symptom. Again, for those of you intrepid enough to open your heart-shaped box, feel free to say ah as we turn down the volume of the past to give voice to a beautiful sound in the present. Lindsay, thank you for coming on board the TV Time Machine. Thanks for having me. Lindsay, tell us about yourself, your background, and what inspired your interest in music. Um, well, I guess it was sort of uh, genetic. My whole family is artists and musicians. My mom's a painter, and my dad's a singer-songwriter. So I guess I was just sort of raised into it. Now, in previous interviews, you've said that as a kid, you were interested in being an inventor. Did that also lead to your uh, interest in music? Yeah, well, I guess I was always interested in music as a kid. And then as I was kind of growing up, I tried a lot of different things. Yeah, I used to want to be an inventor. I loved technology. I loved computers. And then I picked up a violin. And um, I don't know, something just sort of switched, I guess. I don't know how to explain it. (laughs) Now, do you see any parallels between your interest in being an inventor and being a composer? Yeah, I think it's all about creativity and trying to do something different from an inspired place, not something that's, you know, kind of been done or or it's the same thing every day. But um, I do think music is innovation, if you let it be. Lindsay, what does your music mean to you, and what does it say about you? I think that always changes. Um, I don't think it's one thing for me, but right now, with the project I'm doing right now, I'm finishing an album called The Symptom. And the idea behind the album was that everyone has a certain level of dysfunction. And I see a very big pattern, especially in creative type, artistic type. Um, And it's very closeted. Um, You know, things like depression bipolar, um, anxiety, even schizophrenia. Um, and to a lesser degree, you know, uh, people walk around with these, these very sad thoughts and uh, very, feeling very isolated. And there's almost a shame surrounding it, and it doesn't leave much room for people to talk about it. And um, I guess on a much more abstract level than that, um, this album was about me sort of exercising those demons that are in my life that I've struggled with for a very long time, um, including depression. Um, and so these songs are kind of about the different me's sort of talking to each other, the optimist, the pessimist, the, the, um, the in-between, the confused person. And so um, the idea of calling it the symptom, a very clinical name, uh, was just that a... Uh, for me, it was about opening up this this box of things that, that people might be afraid to talk about, especially young people are very isolated and upset about a lot of the things that they experience. And so for me, it was about reaching out and saying, hey, I'm not okay, and that's okay. <laughs> because maybe the human condition isn't always perfectly happy. But isn't it sort of um, a double-edged sword because... Isn't that kind of conflict, doesn't that also add to creativity and maybe actually is the driving force behind creativity? Absolutely, yeah. Um, Something that could be labeled a disease can be a gift. Um, And it's, I think we ask the wrong questions. It's not what's wrong with you, what's broken with you, but it's what's different about you and, and how, and 
and how are you going to live life and function with it and, and make it all live in harmony, you know, the difference between swimming upstream and downstream and going with the things that you are. If you're a creative person, if you're if you're um, a sad person, what are you feeling? How can you relate that to other people, you know? Um, and how can you find happiness in your life? And so I agree. I don't think I would be the same artist without the things, the struggles that I experienced. And kind of in a strange way, if you are perfect, you might not be able to help people as much. But if you have imperfections, you can help a lot of people. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's something you have to grow into. But, yes, I, I believe that um, the struggles that I have gone through and do go through in my life are important. And to some degree, it's, the, it's what I define as my purpose in life is to connect with people and and try and help in this world and in the small, you know, time that I have here is just to connect with people. You know, you're not alone. And um, so I wouldn't give it up. I wouldn't give up the experiences and struggles that I've had in my life because I feel like your struggles and your experiences are what you have to offer to the world. And you've connected with millions of people because you were on The Voice and a lot of the things that I've read online, comments from your fans, have said that your music makes them feel happy. Mm -hmm. Is, has that been a surprise to you, that you've been able to affect people in, in that positive way? Yeah, I don't think I ever saw this for myself, um, connecting with people. And, and I bet that's, you know, part of the dark nature of my own psyche is that um, I probably have parts of me that don't believe that I can connect with people. And so when I see it happening, it's such a beautiful encouragement. I don't think people understand that being a listener, being an audience, is just as equal of a participant as someone who's playing the music. And, um, you know, that my music has brought comfort or happiness to anyone is all that I could ask for. Well, you obviously connected with people on The Voice because I've noticed on The Voice that there are a lot of very, very talented people, you know, with tremendous voices, but they don't really advance in the competition because they're not connecting either with the music emotionally or with the audience. Yeah, um, I kind of refer to that idea as the difference between an artist and an entertainer. You can have a ton of entertainers in the room, but the artist is going to stick out amongst them, not because they have a better voice, not because they're prettier, but because they do exactly what you said they can act. And that's one of the most basic human instincts. We just want that social connection, that, that empathy. And I mean, it's kind of a pack animal sort of thing if you deduct it down to that. But yeah, I mean, we do want to be entertained. Um, but we want artists. We still do. There's still a place for the artists in this world. When you were on The Voice, you performed Say Awe during your blind audition. What was that experience like for you? And is that a particular specialty or joy for you that you can take a song like that and interpret it in a very unique way? Well, first, um, the experience was surprising. Um, I didn't expect that response up until the moment I was standing on the stage. I felt as though I was making a very big mistake, but I had to go with what I had created, what I made. And um, it was... Um, I, I don't know if it's a specialty of mine to do that with songs, but um, it's something I really enjoy, uh, is taking something and giving it your own intentions, um, be it music or, you know, whatever it is, just sort of taking something and building on it. And uh, so, yeah, it's something that I definitely enjoy doing when I'm not writing original music and it's very therapeutic for me because it is someone else's work. So it's not exactly like everything's all the judgments hanging on me. 
And so it is a good place to relax and go and rewrite other people's music. Well, your rendition of Say Ah made a tremendous impact. It really did. I mean, the amount of views on YouTube are amazing. Did that surprise you, the kind of impact that your interpretation had? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, <laughs> I, I, I thought that I would be lucky to just get through the round. But then I saw that, um, especially with, you know, my other contestants, the way they responded and were impressed, it was just, it was such an honor to me. And, and um, I think the culture of taking songs and changing them has been around for a while. I can't take responsibility for that. But um, giving it some exposure, giving these artists, these indie artists that are taking other people's music and changing it, exposure and opening people's minds to that was a really cool thing to participate in. Now, Christina Aguilera, you ultimately chose her to be your coach. Mm-hmm. Going in was, if you can say, <laughs> was was she the coach that you wanted? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Not that I didn't. Um, it was neither. Uh, I guess I just didn't expect it. I didn't expect for us to have any sort of musical connection, which I guess was pretty... Um, ignorant on my part, because after some research, I realized that she did a lot of work with an incredible singer-songwriter named Sia, who is quite up my alley of genre of music, and I should have known, you know, that her spectrum of musical interest is far beyond what she does herself. And um, so, no, I was completely floored. I thought I would go with Adam or Blake or even CeeLo. No, no one really before, I mean, her before no one else. <laughs> Well, she became really your biggest fan. Mm-hmm. What was she like as a coach, and what was it like working with her? She was great. She's my opposite. Um, you know, if you get to know me, you would realize that I'm a, I'm a pretty uh, reserved person. I have a hard time being confident in myself, um, not to the point where I have to, you know, seek gratification. I'm, it's a very personal thing, I guess. And she is a very self-assured person, and not in a negative way at all, in a wonderful way. And, you know, without saying it, I remember once she said to me, because I kept apologizing during rehearsal, because I kept messing up, she's like, you never have to apologize for anything. And obviously she means in the context of music, but it made me realize that if you don't believe in yourself, you're not helping anyone. You're only being a burden to yourself and to other people. Because you can't be who you need to be. You cannot, you can't offer what you can. And so that's kind of what I took away. She said, don't be apologetic for yourself and for others. And so I guess that kind of sums up our relationship. She just sort of shook me and was like, you know, stop being so dark and just do what you need to do. Do what you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> From a technical standpoint, what she taught you what surprised you the most? Did you have any aha experiences when she was coaching you, taking you through that process? I think technically um, she taught me to take risks, I suppose. Like, you know, we don't sit there and do scales, so it's not exactly like a like, physical thing. Um, but she taught me to take risks and to push myself because, you know, if you've seen a Christina Aguilera performance, there's a lot going on <laughs> vocally. And, you know, um, sometimes I can be a bit of a minimalist. And so she just sort of pushed me to be, like, a little bit more embellished, a little bit more of a risk taker, um, not not to hide behind my own voice, but to really push my voice to, to a different limit. And so she would always have me put little pieces in that weren't their little runs or scales or maybe hit an awkward note just because. You know, and so I think that that's what she taught me was risks are good. Right. I think after one of your performances, she said that she wanted you to do that falsetto thing, which you did, and she was very happy about mm-hmm. that. Um, yeah, that was a big one um, that she wanted me to do. And I remember trying a thousand different things right there. Like, I wasn't sure exactly how to do it and um, <laughs> always overthinking. But, yeah, luckily, um, she really did notice that. <laughs> 